Hey guys, this is Joe, founder and host of StartupRate.io. As you guys may already know, I've run this podcast full time since January 2021. I'm very happy to announce that Anchor FM is my sponsor for this podcast. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free and it's easy to use, even for a newbie. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany. As you can see from my Christmas photo, and the Christmas tree in the back. It's the time of the year that Christmas is approaching. And as a tradition here on our channel, we are giving you the FinTech review this year. We have some rotating participants just for the simple reason. This time, unfortunately, Luca from Berlin, from Penta, is sick. Get well soon, man. And therefore, we do have Paolo, as we had last year here with you. Hey, Paolo, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Happy and Christmas. Of- and of course, to kind of a little bit replace uh, Luca, he has the mini me. Can, can you show him? <laughs> yeah, he is. He's on camera. Yes. Can yes. you see on camera? Yes. Good. It's the two of us. This is actually the only place where they can find me and mini me because uh, mini me doesn't travel as much as I do. He stays home watering the plants, you know, <laughs> while I've been spending 30 days on flights in the last year, scouting the fintech world everywhere on the planet. So pretty tired at the year end, but uh, it's good. Yes, I see you traveling all the time. But we also have number three here in the mighty, uh, mighty bands of pirates. Uh, that is Yasin, Dr. Yasin Hankia. Hey, welcome. Hey, uh, good to be back. Um, I missed last year's review, unfortunately, but good to be here again. I remember we had some good discussions over the recent years before. So I'm um, actually looking forward a lot to the discussion coming up now. As you rightly say, the years before. So basically, this is something we are doing since 2014. We, meaning me and the st- startup radio, as now since 2018, the uh, German channel is shut down. This is something we only do in English. And 2017 was the first year we did the FinTech review in English. Nonetheless, if you go down here in the show notes, you'll find the links to the blog web page uh, where you can, of course, find all the FinTech reviews, all the show notes, everything there. Guys, that was a good year for FinTech I've seen, not only for the ICOs, where Yasin surely can tell a few stories about the inside of, um, like it is rumored in the press, somewhere between 35 and 40 million successful ICO, congratulations, by the way, to um, some IPOs we've seen here in Frankfurt, especially Credit Shelf and Deutsche Familienversicherung, as well as the regulatory storm that we discussed last year. So let's pick up the discussions from uh, from the last times, especially in a chronicle order. Um, in 2016, Yasin has been with us and we've been talking about co-branding between fintechs And banks. And there was big discussion going on back in the time, I remember, especially since Yasin was totally in favor of co branding. And I do believe I've seen more than 100 um, corporations alone in in Frankfurt alone that is going on between startups and fintechs. And some of them are co branded. You see yourself confirmed, Yasin? 
Yeah, well, I must honestly say not quite, because I would have expected to um, see this topic even much more pushed um, through marketing, um, which is still a bit limited. Uh, but as you correctly say, I think one of the examples um, also here from Frankfurt is um, the co-branding of Finance School with Deutsche Bank, for example. So this is very prominently played also on their website. Um, and I think that's um, exactly in line with um, how I was thinking about the topic in the past, saying, look, we can, as a bank, show to our customers that we are innovative, we have a great offer here, at the same time leading that under the umbrella and the brand of the startup, so not to confuse the more conservative own clients which you serve. So I think this still is a good solution to be more edgy on the one hand side, to show off that you are into technology, but on the other hand side, not to disturb your more conservative guys you still want to keep as the big bank. So therefore, um, I still believe that this way makes sense. Nevertheless, honestly, I must admit, um, we have seen less banks than I would have expected to move forward in this um, direction. I still think that white label um, corporations um, are more dominant in the market um, and um, the co-branding is still um, just um, a much smaller phenomenon. A uh, personal impression for me as well, for our international viewers who see this the first time, we should tell that Finance Guru, Financial Guru, is a pri is an app that analyzes your spending behavior and optimizes your personal account. Uh, we did an interview back in end of 2016 in English. You can find it down here in the show notes with one of the founders. The company behind it is called The Wins. Just for the simple reason, it's set up by two um, guys and they are actually twins. And they've been very, um, they've been doing very good PR. They've been in Höhle der Löwen, which is actually at the lion stand. It's a German version of Shark Tank. They sold 25% of their equity to Deutsche Bank, one of the first um, fintech investments I was aware of of Deutsche Bank here in Germany, as well as they received after in the aftermath of the Höhle der Löwen, they received an investment from Carsten Maschmeyer, one of the billionaire founders here in Germany. Whew, now we put it in perspective, right? <laughs> Chronologically speaking, Paolo is always talking about um, letter salad, meaning all the regulation. We talked about it a lot in the past fintech review. And I got to admit, at this time, it, it, it wasn't really something I could touch. But um, Luca made it very well when he said PSD2 is like the moment the um, App Store was actually uh turned on and it enabled companies like snapchat like uber j just to work and we have not seen anything like this yet but keep in mind it was 10 years ago the app store opened so things especially create things take time right paolo yes i think that we need to see a regulation this way when we talk about the banking transformation we typically focus on the technological problems related to the uh, legacy systems. And so we always discuss the difficulty of banks to transform the legacy systems to basically adopt uh, agile uh, ways of working in order to uh, become faster in creating new products and cheaper in servicing their customers. However, there's something which is even more uh, problematic for banks and legacy systems, which is legacy leadership. Legacy leadership means uh, how do you transform the way bankers operate, they are remunerated, the way they set up their businesses, therefore the construct of the business model. And that's where regulation typically plays, uh, even though for many that is unnoticed, because regulation can somehow create a different environment that forces bankers to think about how to transform their businesses and their business model. And we know that when it comes to transformation on digital, therefore even startup, the business model is more important than the technology itself because if the business model is wrong and the technology is good, the business doesn't fly. So now we it was something we've seen at pets.com, right? The, the 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 website was pretty awesome, but the business model behind it was pretty flawed. Couldn't go. So now this is the biggest issue for banks, right? So they need to transform the business model clearly using technology. They need to change the way bankers are somehow remunerated or in the way the bankers understand, right? 
the transformation of value from the institution towards the customers. So here we have, uh, among the four different type of regulations that hit uh, the European market uh, in the last year, namely the PSD2, the NIFI2, the GDPR, and uh, the CRIPS regulation 2, which are definitely important. One is the PSD2, and one is uh, the NIFI2. Now, you mentioned the PSD2. I remember a few years ago, most of the banks were considering the PSD2 like uh, a compliance issue, therefore a cost uh, they had to deal with. Uh, what does it mean to expose the API? That is not good for us. Maybe it creates more trouble than anything else. But as time went by, they realized how important it is for them to basically transform it into an open banking type of business. And therefore, if you want to be an open banking and be successful, you need to have a common playing field. Therefore, some sort of a standard where everybody can participate and plug in the value. Because ultimately, the value is not just uh, to have that little thing which is better than somebody else, but to be capable of creating experiences across the board that follow the client. Therefore, all of the APIs, all of the ecosystem that work around that it needs to be somehow structured in a way that can cooperate. So the PSD2 became turned from being a compliance cost into a banking opportunity. And I saw it uh, across the world uh, because everybody, even beyond Europe, started discussing the PSD2 as an example of uh, a regulatory push that forces the industry to rethink itself uh, in a completely different way. And therefore, when I said that three years ago, when I launched my first innovation bestseller, that regulation was an engine of innovation, a lot of people said, this Paolo Cirone is a crazy person, too controversial, what the hell does it mean? And now I think people realize that effectively this is so. And the same we can discuss after is happening with the MIFI too. Yeah, and maybe let me add to this one. I mean, I fully agree on, on what you are saying, Paolo. I mean, here on this one also, what I would like to add is I, I fully see that PSD2 does really open up new opportunities. But I think, and that's the issue as I experienced in the past, banks are pretty much still focused rather on identifying issues, being concerned with cost cutting, not so much looking on the revenue opportunities which are out there, because this indeed, as you say, would require a reinvention of the original banking business model, right? So as you say, If now integrating different accounts, like many banks are already offering in the Deutsche Bank mobile banking app, I can now, of course, integrate all my other accounts. I can do that with ING. I can do that with Commerzbank and all the other app. But this eventually opens up for the very bank the opportunity to aggregate all the financial data of one client. And by having this holistic view, which I would have not had before PSD2, then really offering new services and new services, not only in terms of banking, but also in terms of basically spend optimization, which is also a field SafeDroid is operating in. So basically saying, look, let us identify new channels, how we could actually compensate um, the fact that we are currently in a zero interest environment by basically just saying, maybe it's a good idea, not only earning as we used to in the history from pure financial side, but maybe opening up new revenue channels by selling new electricity contracts, selling mobile phone contracts, um, selling some vouchers for spending side of things. Because if you ask me, in the terms of financial service for the mass market out there, it's not only about financial products, but a normal user is also interested in how he can spend his money in a more smart way. And therefore, I think this is a huge revenue opportunity, but still too few banks are actually actually tapping into this one. I think they're just now a bit exploring, but I think we are just at the starting point for this. There is something else that has been happening here. I'm sorry, Jorn, if, uh, if no I No problem. Jump. Go ahead. And it's related to what you said, you use the word holistic. Therefore, the capability of seeing uh, a client across uh, these multiple dimensions. Uh, typically, clients have uh, more than one account. Uh, some, you know, very active, uh, others just uh, because they need, you know, for, for basic needs. But also, clients have different needs, uh, right? And therefore, uh, It's important for banks to understand how to service them, having in mind the 360 perspective of that individual. That ties directly into the concept of platforms, right? So being capable of providing a platform experience means being capable of finding a client on that platform, making sure that as the client moves along his needs and his journey, he's always on that platform. And this is when we see the change as well. Now, 
the PSD2 has a mechanism that basically is like horizontal because payments become horizontal that can be used to power up some element of uh, the open banking platform so that uh, that becomes holistic. And you know why that is important? Because uh, another criticism that I've been uh, discussing a lot in the fintech scene was uh, the concept of unbundling. So the idea that um, the bank can be unbundled into smaller services that are for individual APIs or individual apps that basically uh, optimize uh, uh, pieces of uh, the bank experience. But we know that uh, to be a platform and to be a successful platform, you need to be capable of bundling back. And the problem here is not to divide the bank into pieces, but for the fintech to be capable of contributing into a bundling process where the pricing is not on the individual service, the prices is on the bundled experience, which is a very complex thing to do. And that doesn't happen overnight. The same is the Amazon experience. Amazon started by providing an experience on one piece only on the e-commerce world. It was selling books. And then expanded his portfolio and managed to create the Amazon Prime, which is basically priced on top of a variety of things, which clients pay like a recurring revenue. Now, this should be, hypothetically, because it's very complex, so critically, the business model of the future for a bank. But to get there, it requires a huge understanding of the value that banks fully generate for the client and how the clients will be willing to pay for this new value at the end of this journey. Therefore, you cannot transform a bank as a derivative. So looking at what the bank is today and trying to digitize a piece or like optimizing individually if you don't have a full perspective. <laughs> You need to think first principles, which is a completely different way of thinking that is very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, we should tell our viewers, our listeners, how banks actually work right now. So basically, they used to be in the past, they have some um, bank advisors that actually are incentivized, are... Um, led by numbers, basically, they have to push into the market X savings account, X depots and stuff like that, that it is like it was in the past, like late 90s, early 2000s, and ever since banking changed. But many banks still have this set up according to products like there's the corporate banking, there's the investment banking, there's the retail banking, there's the asset management, and they don't necessarily in between exchange data and numbers. And now they have to do it like on a basically global basis or at least European basis in order to comply with the regulations. And that makes it totally different because at first they just sold products and now they have to completely change their mindset into what does my customer actually need? Because in the past, it was also like that. You only had this triangle, how the um, clients are segmented. Basically, you had the, the retail clients, like meet the poor guys. Then you had a little bit wealthier clients, like Paolo and Yasin. And then you had the ultra wealthy, the successful entrepreneurs, the Mark Cubans and Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, like on the very top. And that was the only reason they had, and they had this because you could push different products. But now it is becoming much, much different because like, for example, an entrepreneur like Yasin may have the, uh, also a lot of assets to invest. But it's completely different because he's an entrepreneur. He has to care about different things than Paolo, who's basically right now an employee, right? Basically, so I guess uh, the, the point is not to divide individuals uh, by their wealth, uh, but by their needs uh, and technical literacy. Clearly, needs might vary according to the wealth, uh, but is not necessarily linked to an amount of money that you have. Is about uh, your uh, your job, uh, right? What you do is about mm -hmm. your ambitions, right? And how you want to service your ambitions, and then it's about your technical literacy, how much self directed you can be, and uh, how much uh, individual relationships, like human relationships, you need to have because it's very difficult for banks to jump straight into digital. So definitely another thing that we uh, saw that uh, 
the fintech ecosystem started realizing in 2018 is that the hybrid model so far is a very important and relevant model. You saw basically Betterment uh, last year that started hiring human advisors. Uh, you saw Wealthfront uh, out of California. They started adding human advisors on the phone a few months ago. So it's always important to make sure that uh, you always find a way to explain to your customers uh, the value proposition because maybe you understand them more, but not necessarily they understand you, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're digital, they understand the value proposition. So it's a very complex and delicate way of uh, transforming banking, but that's why it is so exciting to be part of it. Exactly, I do agree. And I think here it's really then from, to keep it short, coming from a pure product push distribution approach to a needs-based assessment and then matching, as we already said, the needs with the appropriate products. And um, I think what you are just saying, Paolo, is very important also getting this to the right timing when it's relevant for the customer. Because also, if you look to different products, the relevance of a financial product or a service may be different depending on where I'm currently in the year, how my life changed maybe given because I changed my job, given because maybe I married, a child was born, whatsoever. And I think this makes it much more complicated, but technology is there a great enabler, I think, to cover this complexity. So I think we don't need um, this to be done by individual advisors anymore. Even so, that still, as you say, it does make sense to have a person talking to the end user because we feel that I think it's more a psychological helper at the end. It just for many people still today feels more comfortable discussing with a human person on the other end um, on the line than interacting with a pure technology. That is quite interesting because what I realize right now is like you both talking about different participants in the financial markets. Paolo, a little bit more on the bank side. Yes, and much more on the fintech side. But basically, both are kind of merging together a little bit more. Um, the banks are actually getting away a little bit from their relationship approach and applying more technology. And the fintechs, on the other hand, realize not only can you do it with pure technology it doesn't work you need human interaction and so i see it they get together they get closer together right yes absolutely they do and uh, the reason they get together is because they both want to use this one which is a mobile and the mobile has uh, the same characteristics you actually see that this is my twitter account the pc Ronnie. And, uh, uh, this product placement was not paid for. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But it's always me. It's maybe me, right? There's another one. But, um, you know, we say that the, the mobile is uh, a cool technology. That means it's demand-driven. Uh, while a lot of banking revenues uh, operate into a push economy, is an offer-driven business. Uh, Yasin uh, minutes ago said that uh, the interest rate margin is not allowing banks these days uh, to play like loans and mortgages uh, to make up revenues on the balance sheet after the price of cost of capital. So that is the tendency of many institutions, especially in Europe, to move towards uh, intermediation margin. That means uh, payments, global payments, tourism payments, you know, will have to go down in margin. And what remains is wealth management uh, for everybody. People with small money, with big money, that means investment products and insurance products. But that business, that business uh, is really very much uh, push-oriented. That means that you're, you never told me, Paolo, let's take a look at what is going on on Amazon, right? Because you want to go on Amazon to buy a pair of shoes, and then you see an advertisement in one of my books, and then you want to buy it. But then uh, if you have to invest your money, you typically you know, try to get yourself informed. It takes a lot of time, and then you want to talk to somebody to make a financial decision. Now, banks knew that, but they know that that model is very expensive, and they know that the MIFID II in Europe, as well as the competition, from the American players like Vanguard and Fidelity is pushing the margins down. So they need to use way more technology, but they cannot lose the clients on the way. The syntax started from a technology perspective and they're learning that the psychology of the investor is not the psychology of the consumer. And therefore they need to figure out now how to mix and match and model. That's why co-branding and competition between a human model and a digital model for 2019, 2020 will be somehow winning in many cases uh, compared to other businesses as long as 
the ability to obtain payment, and it can become a volume business, but there's a difference between volume and value. Yep. And I mean, for that moving together also, I think one thing is important to keep in mind here, right? Um, Yes, we are seeing this convergence, but on the other hand side, also what is a bit the motivation? I do think on the the motivation is very different, right? Um, I think on the bank side, it's really about having understood that it's important to apply more technology, less manual work in order to significantly cut costs and live up to the user expectations to have a better matching of product and needs. On the other hand side, I think from the fintech side, um, this is the understanding that the pure digital approach, at least at this point in time, does not yet 100% work. So there is a need in order to increase the cost to put some manual labor to that. Um, and we have seen practical examples, right? So um, scalable capital, I think, is now also starting with some real advisors out there in the field. Then um, Clark, for example, in the insurance space is using um, real people in order um, to call their customers to give personalized advice. So I think we can see that the fintechs who have raised significant amount of money and who have a bit more complex products have understood that this um, human component is essential in order to drive conversion, to drive sales. So therefore, yes, it's a convergence, but I think it's very different motivations of the banks versus the fintechs moving towards the same direction. There is, however, a condition under which this can be transformed. And that condition, I'm not saying it's going to happen or not, but you know, the industry is moving towards a direction is that artificial intelligence becomes truly and deeply conversational because uh, voice is the new marketing. And the moment that happens, uh, your mobile uh, goes from being uh, a demand-driven technology into an offer-driven business and the circle can be closed. But it will take some time if it ever happens. It has to start in e-commerce first uh, before it moves uh, uh, into banking uh, and insurance. Uh, but that is what I'm really looking at, you know, uh, closely every time I can because I'm trying to figure out, you know, if effectively we're improving along the line, you know, and, and in which industry this is starting to happen because that would be truly revolutionary. Okay, the rest would be a transformation. The revolution comes from that only. What has also been a big craze, at least towards the end of last year, um, has been crypto. Appro approximately a year ago, I think uh, Bitcoin hit almost 20,000 US dollars and now it's pretty much down. Um, I remember we've been all a little bit critical about uh, crypto space in the past. Uh, maybe not Yasin because he actually did a successful ICO. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because without touching crypto, we would not do a proper review here, right? Yeah, I think so. But I mean, nevertheless, maybe to start at this point, as you correctly say, right, we have seen this tremendous hype um, in December, um, still also lasting a bit towards January this year, where the price is just skyrocketed like crazy. And I think on this one here, um, in the whole market, there was this crazy kind of party feeling. Um, prices would continue forever going up, um, which at this point should have actually already run, uh, run the alarm bells. Because I think what we've seen here is not a phenomenon which is typical to crypto, but we know that from stock markets, right? It's, it has not been so much different from what we've seen um, at the new economy bubble, um, what we have seen in other areas, which is prices without any fundamental reason were moving up like hell. Um, and um, then, of course, more and more people trying to jump on the running train um, at the end, then really um, resulting in a very strong market correction. That's what we then saw throughout the year of 2018. But if you ask me now, and I think that's the much more important topic than discussing this crazy volatility, which is out there. I always say, for me, it's about the technology rather than the volatility, meaning that I strongly believe, and that's why I also made this move towards the ICO and towards the crypto space, that the technology is here to stay, meaning that at the beginning, we are now in a very early stage of the crypto environment still. Uh, but um, I'm not even sure if the currencies we are currently seeing will be the coins really dominating all the also the future because I think we need to get much more efficient in terms of technology of scalability 
um, of also transactional cost, which is behind the whole um, crypto topic. Um, but let's keep in mind that the opportunities which you can do in real life use cases, which honestly speaking, are not there yet, but will come in the future, have much more to offer than just a big casino as it's currently being perceived in the broader mass market, right? If I ask my friends, people are always, always telling me, look, our price is moving up and down so crazily, I can just do some sports betting and the outcome will be the same. This is actually very sad because if this is the general perspective in the broader mass market about cryptocurrency, then this is definitely wrong, right? People should be um, educated about the opportunities of the technology. People should be given the opportunity to understand what crypto can do for us in the future. And I believe that they will be really striking use cases in retail, um, in shopping, um, in other areas, in financial services also, which will really make a difference and which will clearly show the advantages of the technology to the end user. But this is currently not, at least not in Germany, being the discussion happening in the broader mass market. So therefore, to cut this short, um, I must say, is it really so um, surprising that markets went down 2018 that much? I wouldn't say no, because if you would have learned from past experience in other markets, it's actually a natural behavior. If one thing is hyped, then the hype will come to an end and prices will fall. Does that mean this will be the end of crypto? Definitely no. For me, it's just the starting point. And that was why, and then to come back, sorry for this, um, for this longer uh, talk here, to come back to your question. We did the ICO exactly for this reason, because we saw the technology, we thought, okay, this is a phenomenon which should actually be brought to the mass market. And that's why we did the ICO in order to build a product which will enable mass market adoption. So the new app we have now built, which is currently in beta, which will be um, publicly available then starting from January uh, 2019 is about a very simplistic mobile app which you connect to your credit card and then you can do micro savings and auto convert this micro savings into cryptocurrencies the cryptocurrencies will be securely stored stored so you don't need to sign up for an exchange you don't need to set up a wallet you don't need to handle a private key so we basically remove all the technology complex adoption barriers and we make it very very simplistic for the average user out there to experience crypto with a very small and tiny budget. So to really get the experience in the first place and also thereby opening um, the space, hopefully that people can get a bit more open in their mindset for using crypto in the future. And that's why we did the ICO because we believe in this market. We see it as just the starting point. And as you said, then our ICO was running still in a good time. So market timing was still a bit our friend with our ICO from January to March. That's why we are able to raise still a quite good amount of money. If you look to this phenomenon nowadays, ICO are mostly dead. The ICOs currently running do have even trouble raising half a million, one million. Um, so this market has come um, to a very abrupt end. I do hope that it will recover because I personally think ICOs are a great opportunity for startup refinancing. Of course, we need to discuss about the risks which are um, inherent to this market. But in general, I think it's a good thing if we can bring it to a more sustainable basis. Mm -hmm. um, we should add for everybody who's not as old as I am um, that the effect is already pretty well known. For example, the, the most recent example was the dot-com bubble. Um, but there are examples going back in Germany, for example, Gründer, Krach, uh, Railway Mania may be a very well-known um thing so basically you introduce a new technology the prices go through the roof and then they crash and then there's something good left over for example from the dot-com bubble you guys may know google or amazon which have been around at this time and and they're still here so not everything there is bad but it was an exuberance it, it couldn't last forever well, right paulo there is a difference between a bubble and a scam in any case, but clearly the there smart is. has been overhyped. Now, I'm going to Beijing in a couple of days. Uh, it's one of my last, actually, it's my last assignment that is here publicly, and it's a book signing uh, uh, at the Deming University. But um, what excites me when I go to China 
is that uh, I use the QR code for paying everywhere, and that's all of my WeChat account. So basically, people need to pay with a phone. They don't need uh, a crypto asset. People that need a crypto asset are a minority on the world stage, uh, which are self-directed. It's, it's just like the robo-advisors. Most of the people don't need the robo-advisor. They need to know what they do, basically, with the money. So for whatever reason, which is linked to the idea of making money very fast, uh, the world starts to discussing the wrong topic. So the topic should not have been the evaluation of a crypto per se. It should have been a limited type of uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, topic for a few guys that could basically afford to understand the risks, instead of discussing how technology can be applied so that on top of that technology, a solution is created that services what people really need uh, in their daily life to make their life much easier. I, I do agree. And I think in order that to happen, what we need in the first place is also a stable regulation on a global level, which is still not there, right? If you well, it, the crypto regulation around the world, it's highly differentiated. And I think it's, it's hard to offer something um, on a global scale, given these different regulatory schemes. Because if you look to BaFin, who has taken a very different approach than, say, um, the regulator in the UK and the regulator in France, than um, the SEC. So this still, of course, leaves corporate, private corporates with a huge uh, regulatory risk. And I think that's also a point why we are not yet seeing so many use cases, right? And I mean, just to bring one example, I, I would believe that if I would be a huge retailer, say Amazon, um, there would be a tremendous financial impact in a positive way to my business case if I could offer a own coin to be used for paying goods at my own shop. Because if I can reduce the payment costs I'm currently having with MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, and the likes, and basically internalize this cost by using a own coin to which even I can bundle things like loyalty, things like other product usage, Prime, for example. So I can create much more attractive use cases. I can make users much more sticky and I can internalize cost. I think this can really create a win-win because um, here I, as a player, can have a positive PL impact the user can have a product which is dominant to the product currently being offered, then of course the old players are left out a bit in this space. But this is also the cycle then of innovation. And I believe we'll see something like this once we have a clear regulatory framework. And then there can be much more real life use cases. At this point in time, it's very tough to explain to a normal user out there why one should use crypto. For them, again, it's the casino gambling stuff. But once we would have, and that's that's what, what we are envisaging, once we have a real life use case where I could say, look, what can you do with crypto? You can actually do your purchases on Amazon with crypto. Then the question is answered, right? I don't need to explain anymore what crypto is good for because then everybody will understand by the use case. Bam. And that's, I think, what, what we will need in order to really see this mass market breakthrough. And on the other hand side for the regulation, we have seen SEC now shooting down um, all um, the ETF plans um, which have applied for a license in the US. Um, I think this is another major barrier. Once we see the first SEC approval going in this direction, again, we will have really mass market impact by people understanding, okay, this is much more than what I thought it, it was. And I think if these steps happen, then we can really see positive shocks towards mass market adoption. But unless this happens, it will be very tough to bring crypto to the masses. Well, I, I would say the following. Uh, the reason why Tamagotchi, if you remember the Tamagotchi, was so successful 15 years ago. Is it 15 years ago, Jorn? Is because... Uh, it was cool, but the reason why it's not there anymore is because it was only digital. It didn't live in the real world. The reason why Amazon is so powerful among the digital players is that Amazon de facto is a link between the real world and the online world because it's a marketplace for, for real assets. So that means that every time you link the two worlds, the online and the offline, you have more powers. So to me, the reason why WeChat um, is more powerful than Alipay at the end of uh, the uh, competition between the two Chinese giants is that uh, WeChat grabs uh, the majority of uh, the offline payments uh, with an online technology, right? So is that for capable of linking the two worlds? So 
So now, what does it mean for crypto? I was um, hosting uh, a stage uh, at um, Singapore FinTech Festival uh, last month, uh, inviting some guys talking about financial literacy and technology. And at the same conference, um, they had uh, a keynote by Christine Lagarde, the um, head of the International Monetary Fund, and she publicly uh, basically um, talked about uh, the potential relevance of issuing centrally backed uh, cryptocurrencies. So basically making cryptos uh, or a form of that, uh, which some guys I know would say that's not crypto, okay, something else, but uh, using the technology to transform the way fiat money in the end operates. That would be truly revolutionary here because that would allow to link the online and the offline world. Now, this is not free of uh, complications though. I am an institutionalist individual. I believe in the role of regulation, but I believe in the role of transparency more than control. So, you know, the moment you mix up the two elements, you also create more control for individuals, not just more freedom. So freedom is a romantic statement. Control is something that you don't figure out because you find a convenience, and then you find in the very end that everything basically that you do is somehow tied to more right controlling element. So there are many aspects that I think needs to be considered and understood to make sure that privacy and freedom is, uh, is, uh, is fully accounted for. But I think that the real element for that to be transformed is not even Amazon to use that, but it's for central banks to start playing the game so that they will uh, reconcile, again, bundle back the online world and the offline world. Do you think there will be um, uh, crypto central bank money like the uh, the only thing that is there as a real usable international currency is US dollars, but there's something else. It's called drawing rights. It's basically the share you have in the international monetary fund. Do you think there will be something like the drawing rights between central banks or something like this based on crypto in the future? Well, put it this way, what happened at the height of the global financial crisis is that the Americans realized that uh, they had a problem with the financial system. One of the consequences was the fight uh, against the banking capacity. So that Switzerland, you know, got somehow targeted, you know that. And so Americans wanted to repatriate a lot of money. So the possibility of controlling how money flows, uh, especially these days, because the velocity of money is unprecedented, uh, is an important uh, uh, element for central banks uh, and for policymakers. So now, I know that I'm controversial again. A lot of guys discuss the ideas of the blockchain and the cryptos to be free, but I'm like actually saying, you know, even when it comes to the Bitcoin, I got my points of view, right? Uh, if, you, if you read some of my articles about putting my head up in the very end, um, because there's always somebody more powerful than somebody else, especially if that person retains one million of those Bitcoins and you don't know what those things are. But uh, the, the, the mechanism might also facilitate uh, basically the capability of tracking effectively and instantaneously how money flows, right? And that's very powerful, things about taxation. I know Germany is a country where uh, uh, people prefer to pay cash. It's one of the biggest uh, and more exciting pro-cash countries in the world. Italy is another one. So what would happen if we would not be able to use that thing? Somewhere. Yes, actually, in Germany, it's it's um, here in Frankfurt. There's still a handful of. Unfortunately, we lost we lost Yasin. I I'll invite him back. Maybe there's some interruption with his internet. Um, actually, um, there are some stores in Germany where you can only pay cash. So no debit card, no credit card, no WeChat QR code. Nothing is working. So that's the way we are. But Admittedly, I um I'm I'm used to carry cash around. I do pay a lot of the stuff I do in cash because it's it's easier to keep an overview over that. Um keep an overview. Um I think we're running pretty good in terms of time, but let me talk a little bit about a few things I wanted to share as well, because um I do believe the um Fintech world and the banking world are getting closer and closer together. Two examples that didn't get a very good um, press coverage, especially internationally, 
have been the successful IPOs of Credit Shelf, a Frankfurt-based um, P2P credit platform for German Mittelstand, small and medium enterprises, as well as Deutsche Familienversicherung, which is a direct insurance company, but actually they are um, seeing themselves more as a fintech. Uh, each one raised double-digit millions in the IPO, and they've been the very first ones of their type here in Germany. And nobody realized that if it would have been a startup from Berlin, the international press would be full with it. But um, Frankfurt does have a problem in fintech coverage, right? Well, guys, that, that's more for Yasin, I guess, as a question. <laughs> I, I guess that I spend oh, only 5% well, well, of well, my time in Frankfurt. But if there's someone, so, if there's someone taking it, the fintech Frankfurt scene around the globe, that's definitely me. Yeah, see, I, I think on, on, on this one, um, I think, yes, Frankfurt is having a challenging time if it comes to really competing, not only on the German level, but also on the international level. One must admit that Frankfurt is trying its best to catch up. I think um, there was quite some activity over the recent years, but still, um, just a few days ago, the new um, copyright uh, bug um, study was made very clear that in terms of number of fintechs, money raised, uh, rounds completed in VC funding, and so on and so on, Frankfurt at best um, is number three in Germany. So Berlin coming in first, then Munich being number two, and Frankfurt coming in third only. So yes, that is very true. On the other hand side, if you look to the statistics, one must also honestly admit that, of course, the numbers from Berlin are a bit biased by the extreme outlets, right? And, and that is what doesn't make it so easily comparable. Because if you remember correctly, in 2018, N26 alone raised 140 million euro plus, right? Then just recently, Finley raised 40 million plus. So if I add that together, I already come to more than 180 million euro of the funding, which we are allocated to FinTech in Berlin. If I take these out from the ranking, then the story looks a bit different, right? And I think this is what, what, what one always needs to keep, to keep in mind. It always depends on which statistic you're looking at. And then you can really come to a conclusion how representative and how fair the statistic is. But yes, nevertheless, I don't want to give the impression that Frankfurt uh, is much stronger than it actually um, was displayed in, uh, in, in this competition. At the end, I also have the question, is, is it really so important if it's really, if it's Hamburg, I think we, at least from, I see it more as the German fintech space, we should push that Germany as a country can win now in the competition. Also, I think Paulo can also share his international perspective to this one. Last, please. Um, what you were saying about the IPOs, um, yes, I mean, if we look to the credit shelf IPO, right? Um, I mean, the company has successfully raised 16.5 million euro. Um, they're performing this IP at Deutsche Börse. So, you know, there are quite some tough um, guidelines you need to fulfill. You need to have this perspective. They have done all that properly. Um, I must say, I also know the founders personally. Great job. Um, well deserved. Yeah. Um, and at the end, um, if you look to the media coverage, um, some media was actually headlining, oh, uh, you know, what credit shelf IPO was a disappointment. Honestly, I must say, I cannot understand this kind um, of, of journalism because here, again, I think this is a very classical German approach being negative about things. A positive way in order to foster sentiment for the German startup ecosystem. And that's what I'm not seeing. I see media rather bashing than uh, celebrating, um, which again does not mean that media should be naive to be a bit more positive around the successes which we do have in the German fintech industry. And we just discussed a few, and that's just not being visible in the media. I want to say something important here, therefore, Jorn, about the fintech history of Frankfurt. Tonight, we go to the Christmas market together, and we have something important to celebrate. In December 2008, I went to a notary in Frankfurt to establish my startup my fintech called Capitex that at the end bought in 2013, they wanted to use the API economy to transform well management with client centricity. So we can claim 
that the first head of fintech in Germany was established in Frankfurt in 2008, and this is the 10th year of celebrations. We'll totally make this claim. I don't see any reason for that. Uh, we do have much more um, startup news. If you go down here in the show notes, we have all the stories that have been coming through the IPOs, the down rounds of credit tech, which used to be the most valuable uh, fintech startup in Germany, but apparently it got downgraded to to the value of only the money that you get in and all this stuff like that. But I do believe we should celebrate. Uh, we should end on a high note celebrating 10 years of fintech here in Germany, taking part in the API economy. Good. Good. Yeah, great. great, guys. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you all here and hopefully see you next year. Absolutely. Thanks Merry so much, sir. Great as always. Happy New Have Year. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> Buon Natale. Buon Natale, of course. <laughs> yeah, frohe Weihnachten. Frohe Weihnachten. Here we go. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.